Okay, Bill Simpich is an attorney and anti-war activist. He's been practicing law for 35 years now. He's worked on several important political cases. Uh, he's been in court against both the FBI and the CIA, against the FBI in a case where two political activists were the victims of a car bombing and against the CIA for their involvement in contra drug trafficking. Uh, he's been involved in cases against the Bush administration for their civil liberties clampdown, and he's worked on cases of police shootings in the Bay Area. He's also worked more recently to make sure votes were counted properly in the California Democratic primary. Um, he's written on political assassinations in the 60s, such as the murders of Black Panther leaders Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, CAA attempts on the life of Fidel Castro, and on the assassination of John Kennedy, about which he's written a book called State Secret and a series of articles called The Twelve Who Built the Oswald Legend. So thank you, thank you, Bill, for talking. We're going to talk tonight uh, about the Tippett case. Uh, we're going to focus on that because you you made a, a very very interesting uh, talk at the the Assassination Archives and Research Center conference on the Warren Commission report in, in 20, 2014. Um, so I thought uh, we you know a lot about that. I thought it'd be interesting. Yeah, I'm looking forward to talking about the Tippett uh, story. Quite a saga. Yeah, it really is. Um, do you want to do you want to give us kind of the lay of the land and explain uh, the basic story to us? I, 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 there's a bunch of there's a bunch of really interesting points that you have about you know Officer Westbrook of the Dallas Police, but uh, the the two wallets. But maybe you can kind of give us uh, the the overview of things, and uh, and then we can kind of dig into some of the individual issues. Sounds good. Uh, in a nutshell, the Tippett case has never been properly investigated. Uh, they say that about the Kennedy case, and they're right. But this one is a whole other level of confusion. I, I think, frankly, much of it is because it happened in Dallas. Dallas police are powerful, and uh, we're uh, cowboys then, certainly, and uh, I can't speak about them now. Uh, but I think people were genuinely scared to even talk about the efficacy of their investigation. And uh, the, the overview I would offer is that to understand the Kennedy assassination, the best place, uh, I think, to dig in is between 1230 and 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Because that's the period where Oswald's movements uh, and Tippett's movements are uh, highly contested. And uh, I would suggest there's a reason why. Uh, because uh, what happens during that period of time is not, nothing short of a, of a incredible uh, series of chases. And the question that I pose is, whether or not anybody fired from the sixth floor at all, and certainly whether Oswald fired from the sixth floor. I don't, uh, I'm willing to believe that people posed with guns. I'm not convinced somebody, uh, anybody fired a gun at, out from that floor, and I certainly don't believe that Oswald was one of them. And uh, then uh, the drama moves to where he lived, which was over in Oak Cliff. Now, if you're ever in Dallas, uh, you, you take a look at the map, you go, oh, gosh, you know, where Oswald lived was like, you know, miles away from Oak Cliff, uh, from, uh, from the sixth floor. But the wrinkle is that you can get from downtown Dallas to the Oak Cliff neighborhood in less than five minutes. Then and now, because there's a big old highway that just goes boom right from the area of the depository. And uh, that's what's kind of crazy about it, is because there's a river uh, uh, that uh, uh, called the Trinity River that separates the Dallas proper from the immediate suburbs such as Oak Cliff. And it's a big river valley, if you will. And uh, the way you cross it is on a highway. They literally call it a viaduct. You're crossing over the water. 
And uh, that's where Tippett was parked. Did you know that? Well, right at the end of uh, the viaduct as you enter into Oak Cliff. And Tippett was par- it had his car parked uh, right at a gas station, right where you get off the viaduct and enter Oak Cliff proper. Ah, okay, and, okay. And, so, and, and for the life of me, you know, this is where uh, things really kind of stall in the investigation of the assassination as far as I'm concerned. Uh, because uh, Bill Turner, you know, who just passed away recently, William Turner, was an ex-FBI agent who dove into this case as soon as it happened. And he worked this case and other cases of the RFK case for many years. He worked with Jim Garris and you name it. And uh, Hoover hated him. He hated Hoover. Uh, they had a party in the ways before the assassination. Turner invest- it, it interviewed five people. Uh, who, uh, who either worked at the gas station or w- w- lived around that neck of the woods, and they knew, and several of them knew Tippett. They knew who the cop was. That was not the first time he had parked his car to use it as a lookout. And that's what I believe he was doing that day. He was looking for Oswald. And in fact, uh, Joe McBride, who wrote I think the best book on the subject uh, recently. Uh, interviewed Tippett's father before he passed away, and Tippett's father told uh, the, the writer that uh, he, Tippett's father, was told by the, a Dallas cop or more that, uh, in fact, Os- Tippett was looking for Oswald that day. I mean, that's quite a thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, how did this, this was before Oswald was captured. This is before anybody knew his identity. How, why was Tippett looking for Oswald? So that's amazing information. Now, who, amazing information. who who said that uh, Tippett was looking for Tippett's Oswald's father? Tippett's father. Tippett's father told Joe McBride, the author of uh, this incredible book on Tippett called In, uh, Into the Nightmare. Uh, and uh, McBride spent about 30 years investigating this case. And uh, th- this is what he was told from Tippett's own father before he passed away. Wow. That Tippett, in fact, was looking for Oswald at the time that he died. Now, did Tippett and Oswald ever meet? I'll say right now, I don't think so. I don't think they ever met. I think it, it, this, this, what happened next is a case of of uh, mis- mistaken identity at, you know, at the very best, and uh, collusion and uh, fraud at the worst. Because here's what happened next. If I can take it kind of slow, I think that's the best way to do this. So, um, what happened next was that Tippett abruptly left the gas station. Uh, and either he never saw Oswald go by or he saw him go by and lost him. Because he pulled over a fellow named Andrews and he made him stop his car. And uh, he questioned him for a minute. He ran inside the top 10 uh, record store. And I've been in there. I've chatted with the people at the top 10. And the old phone that was in there is still there today. Uh, Tippett ran inside, used the phone. It wasn't the first time he had done that. And uh, then ran out again. Uh, Oswald, curiously enough, was seen inside that record store earlier that day like that morning, either Oswald or somebody looking a lot like him. Hmm. And uh, so there's some kind of game of foot here. You know, here's a cop who's running in there, can't, uh, only stays on the phone for a few seconds, might have gotten word from somebody, might not have, and runs out again. In any case, Tippett's going full throttle. And then he pulls over to the side of 10th Street, and a man who's walking down the street walks over to his car, uh, Tippett's car, and speaks to him. But he speaks to him through the wing window. Uh, Tippett doesn't even roll down the window. Hmm. And there's an extra policeman's uniform shirt hanging in the car. What's that for? Nobody knows. 
Uh, in any case, at some point, Tippett gets out of the car. And he's walking towards the front of the car to come around to the man, apparently. But he doesn't get any farther than the front of the car because the man pulls out a pistol and he shoots him. One, two, three times. Tippett's on the ground. He steps over Tippett and delivers a coup de grace shot to his head. Uh, I would suggest that is the mark of a trained operator. Uh, which Oswald was not. Hmm. He got hit with all the bullets, and he got and he made sure he uh, killed the man with a fourth shot. Uh, you know, directly to the head. That's not an act of somebody who's not anything but got cold blood in their veins. Then the next thing that happens is equally fast. Uh, the the man who does the shooting uh, reloads his pistol on the spot. And hmm. scatters the shells on the ground. Now, I can understand maybe needing to reload. I don't know that I'd do it there. You know, let people have a better look at it. Okay? All right. And I certainly don't understand why you would leave the shells, the best evidence of the shooting that would match the bullets, right? right. Um, and uh, then he starts to run away. Then and only that does he start the right way. Hmm. So, so there's a, so now he sprinkled the scene with the shells that would be the best evidence of uh, the killing. Uh, the shooter then jogged away. Uh, uh, one or two people try to follow him. Uh, they're unsuccessful. Uh, there's a Mary. Uh, chase with lots of uh, D- Dallas cops who come on the scene. And uh, what I should point out at this juncture is at, at the inception of the cops coming on the scene, uh, the first cop who arrives is a fellow named Kenneth Croy. Kenneth Croy uh, is in plain clothes. And yet, somebody unknown walks up to him and says, I found this at the scene, and it's a wallet. And the wallet's got the ID of Oswald and someone named Alex Fidel. Uh Corey says he has no idea who the witness was. Hmm. Well, I, I, and uh, I think, frankly, that Corey was in on the whole thing hmm. because... Uh, You'll see why in a minute. This is where the two wallet thing comes into bold relief. Um, more officers come on the scene. Uh, uh, Croy's boss, uh, Sergeant Owens, and a fellow who really should not be on the scene at all, uh, uh, the fellow who's head of personnel, a fellow named Captain Pinky Westbrook. Westbrook had been the head of personnel for many years. He's also in plain clothes, by the way, He's giving orders while in plain clothes. Uh, and uh, so Westbrook is a curious case because he had access to all of the personnel files of all of the Dallas police. So he's in a position of great power. Uh, you know, And he's also the head of internal affairs. He's the one who decides whether somebody uh, is brought up on disciplinary charges as well. So in terms of hiring, firing, disciplinary, you name it, uh, and you know, and access to people's most you know private information, he's got it all. And his second in command that month is a guy who's recently been transferred to his department, a uh, uh, fellow named Jerry Hill. Jerry Hill is an officer who was in the TV business before he became a police officer. In the TV business, TV television, hmm. and uh, he was a reporter. Hmm. So he knows public relations. He knows how to communicate with the public. Um, and Jerry Hill and Westbrook are on all the scenes uh, of this uh, assassination. Jerry Hill runs up to the sixth floor within minutes after the shooting 
And he's the one who magically discovers the shells and the paper bag on the scene. The paper bag, there's no photograph of this paper bag at all. The shells are cold. They find a gun. The gun is cold. Nobody ever tests the gun to see if it's been shot recently. Uh, you know, uh, all signs, uh, to, uh, and I mentioned this at length, uh, to my belief is I don't think this gun was fired at all that day. Now you're talking about the the rifle? The On rifle, the... the rifle they found. And, uh, and, and the same is true with the revolver that they eventually found on Oswald. Uh, we'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, but Jerry Hill runs from the scene at the depository, and then he's helping Westbrook look for shells. And uh, he's the one who finds the shells, and he's the one who, uh, and he, then, he, then he and Westbrook wind up running off to the theater. But before they get to the theater, uh, I want to return to the scene of the crime. Because they've taken uh, the body away. They've got this wallet that appeared from nowhere. All the witnesses who were right on the scene at the time of uh, tip shooting immediately afterwards said they never saw a wallet up there. So where did this wallet come from? You know, it came from the sky. It was delivered to the scene. And uh, a fellow named Bob Barrett, who's still alive, an FBI man, he was interviewed on television not that long ago. And he says that Westbrook turned to him and said, you ever heard of a guy named Lee Oswald? And then he said, you ever heard of a guy named Alex Sedell? Uh, and uh, he said, no and no to both those things. And he's looking through the wallet. And you can actually see the wallet. It's filmed and on television. Uh, you can see Westbrook pawing through this wallet. You can't read the Oswald Sedell stuff, but you've got this FBI man's word for it, that that's what he was told. Hmm. And then they get a call all of a sudden saying, you should come out to the theater. Uh, we got somebody in the theater. And uh, so, they, they, you know, Westbrook take, runs to the theater, scene, and he takes charge. Meanwhile, Jerry Hill and his buddies go up to the balcony. And uh, uh, they are there to make the pinch. And uh, so they come storm into the balcony. And uh, uh, there's a lot of school kids up there. And there's a wild practice. But, they, but meanwhile, they see somebody downstairs, uh, uh, some other cops uh, uh, at Westbrook's staff, see somebody downstairs. And that's the Oswald that we know. Uh, and apparently what happened was this. Uh, this fellow named Johnny Boer, a shoe salesman, said he saw somebody hiding in the shadows and then uh, went running into the theater. And then, and from the door they went into, the only place they could get into was Falcon. And then the gal who was ticket taker called the cops at Johnny Boer's behest and said somebody came running in here. And, uh, uh, so the, the, all of a sudden you got 25 cops to fear. How did 25 cops come to the theater just because one guy's hiding in a balcony or ran into a theater? I mean, that it doesn't really make a lot of sense that they were so certain that this was the right guy, but they were, and that's what they did. All right. And in any case, what's so strange about it is uh, that a couple of things. One is killing all of his buddies went storming down the uh, balcony so fast that two of them uh, had sprained ankles by the time they got down to the bottom. Uh, uh, the Oswald, Oswald meanwhile, uh, jumped up and uh, said, no, this is it, and uh, uh, allegedly pulled a revolver out of his, from his waistband, okay? And, uh, you know, he may have done that. He may not have done that. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure which way that goes. But what I am sure about is a couple things. One is that there's a couple reports saying that Oswald was taken out of the balcony, which is not true. He was actually taken out the front door. And there's also uh, an eyewitness who for 20, 25 years, the man who worked in the area, said he saw Oswald being taken out from the fire, fire escape in the back. 
And only in the 90s did he learn that Oswald was taken out the front. And I think what happened was Os, the real Oswald was in the theater the whole time, waiting for some kind of information from wherever he was getting information from. And then uh, their second guy drew attention to Oswald, to somebody who looked a lot like him, by, you know, forcing his way into the theater without paint and being very obvious. And that's what brought the police around. And uh, so I think there was somebody who was impersonating Oswald that got taken out the back. I think there was confusion on the cops' uh, uh, side. I think they were expecting to uh, seize Oswald from the back and, and kill him at that time because he almost got himself killed downstairs. Mm. But he kept screaming police brutality and this and that. And uh, he may have even pulled out the gun himself because uh, he caught he, he he punched the officer right in the face and got to a clinch with him. So it would have been very hard to kill him because it was all in close quarters. Now, was it was and, it full of, were there a lot of people, uh, you know, just a lot of regular people attending nobody, a movie? nobody in the theater. There's, there's about 20 people in the theater. And to top it off, uh, Westbrook told one of the fellas, you know, okay, make a list of all the people in the theater so we can interview them. And the guy promptly lost the list. So we only have, like, two witnesses from inside the theater, maybe three. One of the guys who worked there and two uh, people who were sitting there. The guy who worked there, a guy named Butch Burroughs, said he gave sold popcorn to Oswald right about 1 o'clock, which was before Tippett even got shot. And another fellow named Jack Davis said he was sitting next to Oswald uh, during the beginning credits of the theater. Uh, of the showing of the movie, which was at 1.15, which was right when, the, moments after a, a Tippett got shot. So I don't think, quite frankly, the Tippett, uh, uh, that Oswald uh, was anywhere near the Tippett scene, ever. I think it was somebody else. Hmm. And then attention was brought to everybody's attention to draw the police to the theater where Oswald was. Now, do we know... Uh, that's you what I no, sorry, sorry, but I was just going to, you said 25 cops went into the theater. Uh, we know that kind of most of the cops were supposed to have been in Dealey Plaza. Where, where did this whole big gang of cops come from? Do we know? Were they kind they of... They almost run into the Tippett scene shortly after 1 o'clock. Remember the assassination at 1230. They all come running into the Tippett scene after 1 o'clock, and with good reason. I mean, a fellow cop has been shot dead. To them, uh, to a man, and I do mean a man, because there's very few women in the department, they'll tell you that they were more upset by the Tippett shooting than they were by the Kennedy shooting. Hmm. I mean, you know, it may be a national and a worldwide tragedy, but for them, it's a brother officer gone down. And I would posit that the Tippett shooting is uh, certainly something that motivated the, the department to do whatever they had to do to make sure that this the man they caught was going to be the man who went down for it. Uh, I mean, now there's no division of the cops' eyes about you know who the guilty party is at this point. You know, who, the guy who shot their officer is the guilty party, and as far as they're concerned, that guy is Oswald. And so that's the end of the story. You know, uh, Oswald was indicted for the Tippett murder before he was indicted for the Kennedy murder. Right. Uh, and that, that's the way that played out. So, uh, I, and so the worst of it here is th they picked up Oswald, right? And five cops and Oswald uh, jammed themselves inside the car. Now, what do they, they reach inside Oswald's pocket. What do they supposedly find? A wallet. And the, and the wallet supposedly has, again, Oswald ID and Hedell ID. Now there's two wallets, right? Mm. And, and this Hedell ID is very important because this Hedell ID was used to match with the gun, the rifle. Uh, by the end, by the morning of the next day, they've got word from Chicago that uh, a rifle was purchased from a mail order place there. They could track the mail order all the way to the Dallas post office where all of a sudden they can't ever make sure that it was actually delivered there or that anybody ever picked it up. But, you know, it's a mail-ordered rifle ordered under the name of Aladell. 
And for people like my parents, this is the final proof that Oswald was the person who shot the president, and the story was over. Mm. Because although you didn't have a photo ID and you didn't have an eyewitness, you've got uh, a mail-ordered rifle ordered in the name of the alias of Oswald. And, uh, you know, it's, it's clear Alex Adel was his alias. It's clear that Oswald was a photographer, and it had some fun making uh, a fake draft card with photo on it, which didn't exist, that said Alex Adele on it. All that was pretty clear. The thing that's not so clear, of course, is why would you carry ID like that to an assassination? And you were saying there was there was one ID that was Oswald and one ID that was Heidel, both in the wallet. Right. And to top it off, there's now apparently two wallets. One wallet that was found at the scene, supposedly, and one wallet that was supposedly found in his pocket. And now, the the wallet that was supposedly found in his pocket can now be found in the archives. The wallet that was supposedly found at the wallet that was filled at the uh, scene of the crime has disappeared. We still have video footage of it, okay? Uh, people have had a great time trying to argue about whether it's the same wallet or two different wallets. You know, and you, you can go either way on it. But I would suggest, like a lot of things, you know, in this case, it doesn't matter which conclusion you come to. The important thing is these two, two wallets are virtually identical. And the stories about two, the two wallets are identical, that they had Oswald ID and Hedell ID. And why in the world would an assassin leave his wallet at the crime scene. You know, I mean, it just, it just, it, it's beggars the imagination. It uh, does. And, and, and why wouldn't anybody have seen it at the crime scene? You know, instead it's just handed to a cop and said, this is what I found from a mysterious witness whose name is not obtained. Just like 20 mysterious witnesses that could have really cleared up what happened in the theater, and but the list was lost, so we don't have it. This case is based on phony evidence, you know, from top to bottom. So this was this and, wallet was filmed by a TV crew that had shown up at the murder of the Tippett scene. Is that right? That's correct. And then it was and shown on TV. Right yep, and that footage is on YouTube today. Mm. And you can see the photo uh, examination for yourself if you go to YouTube and see my talk on. Captain Westbrook and the ticket shoot. Right. And everybody really should watch that. That's a, that was a really great talk. Um, so uh, so you've got – well, I mean, do you feel like uh, – you feel like kind of them finding the wallet is the end of, uh, of the, the basic uh, scene that you want to paint? And we should go over these point by point? Or? Yeah. Yeah, no, that, I think that's a good place to wrap it for now. Uh, let's go back and approach it any way you want. Okay, great. So the one of the more interesting things that you discussed in your talk was just the original ID that was given uh, to even, uh, you know, the description that was put out for the police to even, even look for Oswald. So do you want to, uh, you know, we've heard forever that it was, uh, someone in Dealey Plaza had kind of seen him through the sixth floor window, but but you kind of prove that's not correct with documents from Hoover and other people. Do you want to do you want to talk about that whole the ID? Yeah, that this is one of the things that got me really going on the whole Kennedy case uh, in terms of writing about it as opposed to reading about it because I was so intense and so angry, and the only other person who had really picked up on this was Peter Dale Scott, who is a marvelous sleuth in his own right. Um, there was an ID uh, that was on the radio 15 minutes after uh, Kennedy was shot. And it's on the, over the Dallas radio. And it says the shooter was 5'10 and 165 pounds. And uh, there's a little bit more to it, but that's the essential part of it. Now, uh, I, I was really struck by that. They said it five more times. Where did it come from? It came from a, a fella named Herbert Sawyer, who was a detective on the scene. And he was guarding the back door of the imposter to make sure nobody was running out 
from there without being checked first. Uh, they basically sealed off the building somewhere. Uh, so, uh, this 5 to 10 155, uh, he was told this by, by a person. They said, what do you look like? He said, well, he's white, not too young, not too old, not too fat, not too thin, just kind of average look. Okay. What was his name? I don't know. What did you do with him after you got this statement? Oh, I gave him over to one of the sheriffs. And do you know what sheriff? No. Did you ever see this man again? No. Was Sawyer implicated in this case? Unclear. Maybe yes, maybe no. Not that important. The important thing is this crazy ID. His ID came from an unknown man who was turned over to the sheriff. Now, there's a fellow who claims to have been that unknown man, and that man is Howard Brennan. Howard Brennan was a, uh, was a um, pipe fitter, something like that, working man. And he uh, claims to have seen the man, uh, but the ID, one, doesn't make any sense. And two, if you go through the records, even J. Edgar Hoover didn't believe that Brennan had seen this guy. The ID doesn't make any sense. Brennan would have been... Brennan would have been looking up to the sixth floor. Okay, now maybe he saw somebody posing with a gun, maybe not. But the important thing is, you're not going to be able to tell whether the person's five foot ten or 165 pounds looking through a window from the street. You know, you'd be lucky to even be able to see the gun, much less the person's face. If you saw the person's face, you don't see their whole body. You don't see how tall they are. You don't see, you can't tell their weight. The one thing you can tell is the color of their shirt. But we don't have any of that in this description. That's the first thing that he was wearing a white shirt. He's wearing a blue shirt. But there's none of that. It's a, it, that's a phony ID. Uh, uh, I wrote about it in my book at great length. But I'm afraid he didn't see Oswald. And he didn't see anybody 5 foot 10, 165 in the window. No. Uh, the, the 5 foot 10, 165 description comes from a description of Oswald, but it's only one that is that you see. Oswald was a smaller guy for that. He was five foot nine, but more importantly, you know, when he when he died, he weighed 126. Hmm. Uh, he would never weigh more than 135, 140. Uh, this 165 is simply too stocky a guy for Oswald. But where uh, where you do see it is you see it back in the Soviet Union. There's a very mysterious description of Oswald that supposedly came from his mother. I don't believe it did. But it says 5 foot 10 and 165. And you see this description drifting through intelligence documents. Uh, you even see it in Mexico City. Uh, in one, There's two different sets of documents in Mexico City, and that's one set. Another set uh, it's completely different. It, it, this one describes Oswald as six foot, a husky, uh, completely description, completely different description, description yet again. Uh, so this five foot ten, one sixty five is an intelligence legend. Now, why all of a sudden are you seeing this intelligence legend being broadcast over the radio? Well, I would suggest that you know, uh, whatever happened. The Sawyer, whether it was a real person or a fake person, it got translated in a very odd way uh, over the radio. And uh, and the other thing that's really interesting is all through the war uh, thing, you know, they know that Oswald was described as 5'10", 165. Did they ever think it was strange that uh, the radio was basically repeating what was in the intelligence documents about Oswald? I mean, that's more than just coincidence. That's more than just coincidence. Something very strange has happened here. I personally just believe that Sawyer was in the middle of it all. Sawyer wound up having to leave the police department in disgrace. He quit rather than being uh, charged with perjury. As I recall. Mm. Uh, that's yet another story. But, uh, but so that 5'10", 165 description is, in my mind, completely phony. And illustrates uh, the intelligence fingerprints all around Oswald. Hmm. Okay, so you were you were talking about Sawyer 
you've talked about Hill, you've talked about Westbrook. Uh, let's start with maybe we can talk about kind of who you see as the core of maybe the uh, maybe the people in the Dallas police who who seem to be guiding events or know a little bit more than they should yeah. have. Can we? I, I you can found start with Westbrook and Hill. Yeah. You okay. Yeah. Those two guys. Well, yeah, I'd like to let's let's talk about Westbrook because, and I especially want to hear you know what you know more about uh, what he went on to do because you said that he kind of went on to even be working with the South Vietnamese police, kind of in a very. We know the CIA used to do training for uh, local police forces in the United States. That kind of became a scandal uh, in the era of Watergate and the Church Committee. But we also saw that local police would end up going, uh, presumably with the CIA training, to places like Vietnam, where uh, they would train the police forces of those regimes over there. So do you want to talk about him and, and his background? Well, well I well, well, you know, the, 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 uh, let me start with what I think is the weakest argument first, which is what you just brought up, not because of any disrespect for you, but because we don't have a document uh, proving that he was a liaison between the CIA and the South Vietnamese Police Department. This is all hearsay, and so I, 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 it, it has the ring of truth, but I don't have the document, so I'm always kind of wary of making that claim. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, but I will say this, uh, Westbrook and Hill both uh, approached this case in a very strange way. He had, first off, Westbrook had no business being on the scene in the first place. He had as much business being on the scene as I would, okay? And I was 11 years old. You know, his, uh, he worked, in, you know, the personnel beat for the internal affairs for the police department. He's not, he, he, you know, he has no experience being out there at crime scenes. You know, none. He's not supposed to be doing that work. He right. referred to him because he was a captain, but he's not supposed to be there. So he's not wearing a uniform. And, uh, and uh, he claims to have just been, you know, caught up in events. You know, he walked all the way uh, from the police department to the sixth floor and then jumped in a car and drove through Tippett scene, then jumped in a car and drove through here. And uh, Hill was in the same uh, boat on that. Hill actually got to the theater, got to the depository within 20 minutes. And it's like, you can see him in film. He's like leaping out of another officer's car and running upstairs. And, uh, and so it, it, it's, it's kind of problematic why these, gentlemen are there at all. Hill is answering the Westbrook. Hill is not a, a detective. You know, he's just not. He's not supposed to be in there. Now, of course, it was a chaotic scene, but how did he even know to go in there? You know, the initial calls that went out are saying they thought the shots came from the overpass, not from the depository. That came a little bit later. So, uh, it, it, and he went up there and, you know, and charged up you know, to the top floor with great certainty about his approach. And uh, you can see a picture of Hill leaning out the window, shouting to the police, you know, to bring the crime drive up, you mm -hmm. know? And uh, so I think, frankly, Luke Mooney claims that he found the shells, but I think that Luke deferred to Hill in this little uh, operation here. And that... Uh, uh, it's entirely possible that Phil planted the shells and then said, "Luke, to Luke, look, you know, look, I, look at this. I'll go out and call the, you know, constables." And he did. And then, within moments, Phil is screaming off, and so is Westbrook off to the next scene, which you know, is, again, it's understandable that they put themselves in leadership roles immediately at the scene. Uh, Hill admittedly lied to the uh, Warren Commission in a couple of respects. He claimed to have found an automatic shell uh, at the scene, 
And, uh, and, and, uh, but he didn't admit it till the 1980s when they asked him if he was a person who called in in the 1960s investigation. He says, no, that wasn't me. He admitted it 20 years later when, the, when there was no longer any heat that could be applied to him. Uh, why he called it in as an automatic, uh, it's not a mistake to be easily made at all, uh, which I talked about at length as well. So the, the bottom line with Hill and with Westbrook is why are they in leadership positions over and over again uh, on the scene when they're not really supposed to be? And why uh, are they uh, giving false information and not admitting uh, information like, hey, we found a wallet at the crime scene. You know, hey, it's Oswald's wallet. Why is he admitting that? And uh, Bob Barrett, the FBI man, was asked about this, and he goes, oh, you know, they, well, Bentley called it in. Bentley was the guy who supposedly found it in his pocket. I'll get to Bentley a little bit later. And uh, so we didn't want to, uh, you know, he apparently just didn't want to screw things up. Well, Here's the most important investigation in history of the United States, to me at least, the, the assassination of President Kennedy. And they're fibbing about the most important evidence, whether or not there was a wallet that was found at the crime scene, and whether or not that wallet had uh, the ID of Oswald and Nadell in it, and they're lying about it. Well, uh, when Bentley, uh, Barrett was asked a couple of years ago about Bentley claimed that he found it uh, the wallet in Oswald's pocket. He goes, no, that's hogwash. That's just not true. You know, I saw it with my own eyes, and that wallet was a crime. And so here you had an FBI agent calling the guy who was the head of the polygraph, Paul Bentley, calling him a liar. And then uh, you've got uh, a situation where uh, at the theater, uh, there's a scuffle with Oswald, the, uh, the arresting officer. And Joe, Jerry Hill is the guy who winds up with the revolver. And Jerry is claiming that there is a, a mark on the bullet that shows that Oswald tried to fire the gun and shoot the officer inside the theater. And then, it, again, it's the FBI who is called to testify to the Warren Commission. They go, well, actually, you know what? That's not true. There is no such mark on the bullet. Hmm. So Jerry Hill has lied yet again about something really fundamental to the case, you know, about whether or not Oswald tried to kill an officer in the act of being apprehended. Hmm. So Hill is not trustworthy to me at all, and, and neither is Westbrook. But it gets a little bit worse. Because at 5 o'clock, 5.30, uh, Jerry Hill gets on national television. And he's the guy who proceeds, you know, w you know and he's good at telling the story. Because he's a trained TV reporter, right? And he tells the entire story of uh, Lee Harvey Oswald in the Soviet Union as a defector and then marrying uh, this lady, you know, Marina, a Russian woman from Minsk, you know, he's telling this to, to the entire world. Hmm. Yeah, and this guy's just, you know, a, you know, a beat officer working in personnel. And, you know, somebody asked me, Jerry, how in the world did you get all that information? Because he's miles ahead of, you know, at ABC and NBC and CBS. And he's like, oh, I got it all from Westbrook. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> well, you know, Wow. Uh, that's quite a thing. That's quite a thing. He says he got it from Westbrook about 3.30, and he tells the story at 5, and then he goes to his little church group at 6. Hmm. And he pretends to be as befuddled as everybody else. I mean, he's just changed the course of history by telling the world the background of the assassin, you know, that the background that, you know, the, the major news agencies still were trying to catch up on. Uh, uh, it's an incredible story, and I, I don't believe it. And I don't think there's any reason anybody should believe that uh, uh, Hill was uh, anything but a witting player in this whole drama. And I think he was a witting player before it happened. I don't think this is just serendipity. I think this is part of a 
team mm. to make sure that the right person is brought down. Now, do we know what happened to? Um, do we know what happened to either of these guys? Kind of uh, in the in the rest of their lives. I mean, I know the. It sounds like that office of public security thing is a little not very hard. Uh, do we know anything about kind of what happened to these guys after the fact? Uh, well, they certainly didn't. They certainly weren't disciplined. Kind of made Right. They certainly weren't uh, punished. Westbrook was, uh, you know, put in charge of trying to figure out what happened to Jack Ruby. Uh, mm. When, in fact, one of the people who was helping hide Ruby's body in the basement before the shooting was this guy, Kenneth Croy, the same guy who came up with the wallet at the crime scene. Uh, and, uh, and, and they were, uh, there's people who believe that Jerry Hill, you know, was in the car that picked up Oswald uh, at one o'clock. If Oswald ever, uh, if, you know, assuming that Oswald went back to his home and got his revolver, which is the story we've been told. Um, and, and because the, the, one of the numbers that the lady gave matched the car that Hill was in. But Westbrook uh, assured everybody that uh, it wasn't a Dallas police car that was involved in that. And uh, now this was sorry, this, to, uh, this was when uh, this was the the owner of the boarding house where Oswald lived. Right. She heard the right. horn honk. Exactly, but Westbrook never revealed that one of the numbers of the car that supposedly picked up Oswald was the very car that Jerry Hill was in that day. He never he didn't reveal his conflict of interest or anything like that. He did never mention Jerry Hill's name. Um, and and the, uh, Westbrook left the forest and, and went allegedly to Vietnam shortly afterwards. Jerry stayed with the force and had a pretty humdrum life, you know, occasionally interviewed. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I really am very critical, frankly, of the research community for giving this guy such a big old pass. Uh, there was only a couple of people who were tough enough to try to, you know, uh, get Jerry to give interviews. And Jerry did give interviews occasionally, and he was very evasive. You know, he spent most of his time just saying, you know, what a good guy he was, and what good guys were on the Dallas, in the Dallas Police Department. But he was very careful to not commit himself to a lot of that. Uh, but what, one of the things that troubles me the most is uh, the other fellow that I really look at very carefully is this guy, Paul Bentley. Bentley was with Hill uh, in the balcony. He was one of the guys who uh, hurt his leg so badly running down the stairs. Mm. Uh, Bentley was the head of the polygraph department. And Bentley was the guy who uh, had supposedly found the wallet in Oswald's pocket, which I don't believe happened. Um, or certainly the FBI knew the police had. And then Bentley was also the guy who interviewed uh, Buell Frazier, uh, Oswald's buddy at the Texas Depository, about whether Oswald had brought in a big bag. Uh, Frazier said, you know, the, he had, the bag he had was very small and couldn't possibly have fit a rifle. Uh, Frazier was polygraphed that day. Uh, and apparently he got a clean slate because he was sent home without any charges that night. So the rest of his life, uh, Bentley denied, uh, uh, ever having polygraph Frazier, even though other people in the team admitted it. And even though Frazier said I was polygraphed, they couldn't find any documents about the polygraph. And Bentley would never say a word about it. He said, I just don't remember anything about him being polygraphed at all. And Bentley, I think, is, was literally a bent officer. I think he was lying throughout. And uh, I, I think those three, to me, are in the core of what happened uh, in terms of uh, framing Oswald as a suspect. No, 
Uh, what was the threat they did? Do you? I don't know. Do you know about the confession they tried to get Frazier to sign or threatened him with? Well, the problem with that story is it's impossible. It all comes from Frazier. Ah, okay. Yeah. You know, we don't have any documents. We have a lot of bluster about how, you know, Jerry Wilfred's tried to get him to sign it, and he threatened to punch him, and Bill said, oh, I'll punch you several times. I'll get some good looks in on the floor. It's all bothered up. Hmm. I'll tell you my problem with this whole piece of the story is that I think Buell Frazier was scared. And I think, and I don't know if you've ever heard this story, but I do like to tell it. It's quick. Uh, Buell Frazier and Oswald didn't have much in common. One of the things they did have in common is they liked to talk about life. Okay? They did. And uh, uh, Buell had a life. And he had it, what's called an and, and Oswald, you know, uh, allegedly had a rifle, although I don't know which rifle it was. Um, and uh, the rifle that Buell Frazier had was called an Enfield 303. What's so interesting is that at 2 o'clock the afternoon of the assassination, NBC picked up the story saying we, they found a rifle in the depository, and the rifle was an Enfield 303. Mm. And that's the moment where Buell Frazier just kind of disappeared from the map. He just literally, nobody knows where Buell Frazier was between 2 and 6 o'clock. Buell says that he was with his stepfather in the hospital, just like left the scene of the assassination and went to visit his stepfather, who he hated, by the way. He had a terrible relationship with him. And he was found there with him at 6 o'clock that night. But I don't think he was there at 2 o'clock. I, I, I think he was there with his sister, uh, shuddering, saying, oh, my God, somebody's trying to frame me for the assassination of the president. What am I going to do? Mm. And I think they talked about it for an hour and a half. And then uh, his sister went across uh, the street uh, when the cops were talking to Ruth Payne, who lived right across the street. And uh, she engaged them in conversation. And... Uh, told him her little piece of the story, and she knew which wasn't very much. But she didn't tell him where Buell was. And uh, we've never had a satisfactory story from Buell where he was between 2 and 6 o'clock that evening. Uh, and I, I think Buell was quite rightly scared for his life. I think they made up that story, quite frankly, about him having a small bag. They didn't want to get caught up with knowing that Oswald had carried a gun. So they made sure the story went so that the bag was much too small for a rifle to be concealed. Mm. I think that's the way that played out. But it turned out that that story got run on Jerry Hill's old station. Mm. And then that got picked up by NBC. And then within an hour, they retracted the story mysteriously. Nobody knows where that story came from, and nobody knows how it was retracted. But, if, but we all know you can you can see it you can hear it yourself if you listen to a full copy of the tapes hmm. of uh, the assassination that day. You know this Enfield 303 story just appears right out of nowhere. Interesting, and that's the I guess that would be the third rifle that they heard about because you have the Mauser that was right, the Mauser, the Enfield, and finally the. King Carter. Now, I'll say, my, my, just while we're just chatting about it, some people think that they found a Mauser on the sixth floor. I don't think they did. I think they found a Mamlicker the whole time. I think that there might have been some chit chat among the officers uh, 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 with the personnel inside the building about the Mauser. Because, in fact, uh, one of the heads of uh, the building brought in a Mauser to show off a couple days before the shooting. So I think there might have even been some jiggery pokery where people said, well, we found a Mauser trying to get somebody else to say something about what they knew. Mm. Because, you know, I mean, I, I don't think all the cops here were on the take by any means. There was just a few bent cops, and the cops are free, of course, to use information they pick up to try to get other people caught by telling tips. So I think the Mauser story may have been circulated simply to see if somebody would call 
myself up some more information about a Mazur because they had heard a Mazur been in the building that way. Hmm. Nothing more. Interesting. Um, uh, sorry, where was I? Uh, okay, so do uh, you want to... I mean, we've talked a lot about the two wallets, but do you want to talk about how the cover-up more of that? Because it's interesting to to figure out even, you know, nobody talked about that other wallet for, for decades and decades, and then suddenly it appears in Hostie's book and in, well, I guess the video is rediscovered. Do you want to, do you want to talk about how this kind of came to the front and, and how that the initial wallet got lost, quote-unquote? Well, well, that's the problem, isn't it? Uh, because ha- nobody mentioned it for 32 years until Hostie stuck it in his book in 1995. You know, I'm cynical enough to think Hoppy put it in his book uh, uh, because he wanted to sell books. And he knew he had a piece of dirt, so he thought he'd insert it in there. Uh, I've never really completely known what to make out of Hoppy, uh, other than that I don't think he was in on it, the, the, the crime. Uh, but I think he knew more than he was supposed to know by his own admission. And uh, uh, I think he used that, he decided to release that little piece of information as a way to try to vindicate himself uh, in the, in, frankly, in the research community, because uh, the research community held him in very low esteem, because he had lied in the past uh, about uh, Oswald and his relationship with Oswald, and the fact that he destroyed documents the day of the assassination, or the day of Oswald's death, supposedly, uh, at the order of his boss, who said, you know, uh, you got a note from Oswald before the assassination. Oswald, uh, he'd gone by Oswald's, uh, Mrs. Oswald, Mrs. Payne, and said he wanted to talk to Lee in the weeks before the assassination. And uh, he was doing his job because, uh, you know, Oswald was a read effector to the United States. Uh, he had been arrested in New Orleans. Uh, it made sense for them to follow up and see what Oswald was up to because uh, uh, he worked for subversive feet. Most of his people, seriously enough, were right wing he looked at, uh, not left wing uh, but uh, one thing I've thought about is that it's not impossible that he thought Oswald was a right winger disguising himself. Um, that's uh, not all that important, though, at the end of the day. The important thing is that Hostie stuck it in his book, and that's when people started thinking about this wallet story really seriously for the first time. Uh, that, that film had always been around about these guys looking at a wallet, but they never considered the wallet that important until they realized that the wallet was allegedly Oswald's wallet. And they started talking to more cops, and the cops were willing to talk a little bit about what they knew about the wallet. And it all grew like topsy over the last 20 years, the wallet. Hmm. Um, now, there's one other character that you talk about in... You, you briefly talk about him in your talk, but then Don Thomas, another researcher, had kind of talked a little bit more and added a really interesting wrinkle about his station wagon uh, being seen around around the the scene of the Tippett shooting. And I, I don't want to screw the story up; it's a long story. But do you no, want to talk no, about Mather? Uh, Mather. <laughs> Well, the Carl Mather story is a complete doozy. Uh, you you got to keep in mind that the guy who did the footwork on it went on to become the mayor of Dallas. Hmm. If you can believe it, fell in West Wise. Okay, so this is not exactly uh, a, a not well documented story. This is a very well documented. Story. Well, okay. The way the way the story goes is this: that. Uh, uh, Carl Mather was friends with uh, J.D. Tippett. In fact, the story is that Mather and Tippett were together at uh, 
I believe to Potomac that morning. Now, uh, Tippett is assassinated 45 minutes after Kennedy, more or less. You know, somewhere between 1 and 1.15 in the afternoon. At 2 uh, o'clock, a mechanic who used to be a cop, I might add, uh, which uh, makes sense when you hear what about, is about to happen. Uh, sees this guy in a red car parked near his garage, and he, he's looking kind of shifty. You know, there's no reason for him to be there. So he walks up to him to try to talk to him, and the guy drives away. And because he drove away so suddenly, he wrote down his plate. The mechanic did, and uh, then. Uh, West Wise the reporter who becomes a mayor talks to this you know mechanic who used to be a cop and the mechanic cop turns over the plates to West Wise and West Wise does a run on the plates and the maid comes out to be Mather's car which is kind of strange because Mather's car is a blue car not a red car but apparently the plates got taken off and put on this red car um, and, uh, to top it off, the fella who, uh, the mechanic cop who called in the plates said, I'll tell you right now, if you asked me who that guy was driving the car, I'd say it was Lee Oswald, but it was, I guess that's impossible because he was under arrest at that point. That was right about the time Oswald got arrested. So the story goes that Mather, uh, lent his car or his plates at least to somebody who was like an Oswald kind of double. Uh, I mean, it's remarkable that they got the plates. And Mather uh, uh, was deeper in the story because now Tippett's dead. Mather and his wife go to the Tippett home, and they are the ones that comfort Mrs. Tippett. And to make it even stranger, um, Mrs. Mather goes off and leaves Mr. Mather with the grieving widow. And the thinking is, is that Mr. Mather was needed to handle the poor, distraught widow while Mrs. Mather went off to deal with the son. Um, who ever heard of the husband? being the one who'd stay in company with the widow. It's, not, it's usually women comforting women, not right. this kind of thing. So it's kind of strange, to put it mildly. Uh, and it gets a little stranger when you think about where Mather worked, which was at Collins Radio. Collins Radio was deeply intelligence-connected. In fact, they were the, the, the shop that made the radios that were used by the CIA. Hmm. Uh, college Radio has a long uh, military intelligence connection. So, uh, Carl Mather is a person of interest. And uh, there's some, uh, we're going to see a few documents hopefully this year about the Carl Mather story. Uh, I believe he was given immunity in order to talk to the House Select Committee of Assassinations at all. Hmm. So, we may learn a little bit more about that in October, but the Carl Mather story is fascinating. And those have been held back for uh, documents that... Yeah, yeah. The interview with Mather, I believe, has been held back. So I think <laughs> we'll get to see it in October. I don't know how much we'll really learn, to be honest, but maybe a little bit more than we now have. That's interesting. And Wes Wise, when he, Wes Wise has never let go of the story. But after he became mayor of Dallas, you know, he just stopped beating the bushes the way he did in the years past. And I think it was because he felt hopeless. That's the way I heard it secondhand. He just felt like nobody was really interested in getting to the bottom of the case uh, among those in authority who had power. So they really left it to the citizens of the research community to piece together all these jigsaw pieces over the last 50 odd years. And when, when when was he mayor? Just out of curiosity. 1970. Oh, okay, okay. Two term mayor, though, we thought. Okay. Uh, so, if, if uh, are you still good to talk a little more? Yeah. Okay. Um, 
if we if we talk about I know when you were when you made your talk the first question was what was the the motive uh, for the tippet killing and I know that uh, I just want to get your thoughts I know in Joseph McBride's book I haven't read the book but I've heard him talk he was saying that you know he heard word that tippet could have been involved in narcotics trafficking I wonder if if we can talk a little bit about tippet himself what you know and then you know. What kind of – this is something I feel like you probably know about because you've worked a lot on uh, police cases and CA corruption cases. But, uh, you know, what was kind of the scene of the Dallas Police Department? What what corrupting influences were there? What – we know Dallas was a kind of a horribly racist town. I heard something that only 1% of uh, the Africans, Americans in Dallas were – uh, registered to vote even in 1963. Uh, what were some of the forces at play kind of within the Dallas police and maybe with Tippett uh, being involved in the same underworld as, as maybe not directly, but as Jack Ruby was part of just kind of the, the underworld of Dallas and how that interacted with the Dallas Police Department? Well, it's funny. Uh, Kenneth Croy, the cop, the dirty cop I talked about earlier, uh, who found the wallet supposedly. Uh, he he had supposedly during the mo- moments between Kennedy's assassination and t- the tip assassination that hour, he was having lunch with his estranged wife in this place called Austin's Barbecue, which was a known place for the Bircher crowd and the, the Klan crowd. And Tippett worked security there. He moonlighted there, so he was familiar with that milieu, certainly. Uh, and uh, I don't know anything about narcotics stuff. I don't know whether uh, he was a clean cop or a dirty cop. I think he was a right wing cop, for what it's worth. Hmm. I don't know that he was in on the hit or not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not at this point casting any aspersions on Tippett's character. My thinking, and this is just my thinking, uh, is that I think Tippett was supposed to die. I, you know, some people, and I've thought about it, it might have been a busted up operation and they they, they wound up killing him because things had gone wrong, okay? But in any case, the net effect of the tip of assassination, as I said earlier, was to pull 100% of the cops to be 100% in terms of bringing down Oswald by any means, fair or foul. Because the cop is now dead. And it, it, and it really heightened the contradictions and uh, made an already incredibly crazy situation ten times crazier. Uh, so I, that's my thinking, is that I don't know if Tippett was uh, a, a good cop or a bad cop, but I, my personal hunch is that he was doomed to die. Hmm. Uh, you are going to do uh, in Houston, in November, you're going to be part of the mock trial. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, Larry Shaft and I are going to do like the what I call the forensic evidence. We're going to examine the bullets and the shells and the rifle and all the minutiae. And uh, Cyril West, who's also an attorney as well as a pathologist, and Bob Tannenbaum, who was one of the HSCA attorneys, they're going to do their piece of the case that revolves around the autopsy, which is, you know, a big subject and also covers a lot of ground. And uh, we'll be up uh, against a prosecutor from Notre Dame, and we've got a Texas judge, uh, and the Notre Dame prosecutor is very motivated because his dad actually met Kennedy the night before his assassination in Fort Worth, and, or in Houston. And we'll be doing this in Houston. Uh, so, so somewhere out there is where they met. And uh, so it's always been a big thing in their family. And uh, we're all pleased to be working together. And at the same time, we'll be trying to really treat this as a very serious enterprise in terms of making sure we get the evidence right. Uh, my my hope, frankly, is that we'll be able to convert the prosecutor and the judge by the time this case is over. Mm. I don't think anybody, you know, only in the last 20 years have we had enough access to the evidence to show just how phony it is. Uh, our pre- predecessors in researching this case didn't have the access to the massive amount of documents we have now thanks to the Oliver's Stone moment. 
Right. Uh, in case your listeners don't know, when the Oliver Stone movie got released, Congress was so outraged, and uh, that and the public was so outraged, and they wrote Congress. Uh, the Congress released like six million pages of documents have been withheld for decades on this case. So we know a heck of a lot more about this case than we did in 1991, which is when the movie came out. Right. And even the uh, even the the files from the House Select Committee, I guess, which was kind of initially those had all been even put aside for for 50 years. So uh, that's right. It was it was a travesty. Every time you did an investigation, all you were doing was preventing the public and investigators from seeing the most important files. And kind of, I guess that would be the opposite of the, I guess, looking back, uh, the Warren Commission probably felt they made a huge mistake by releasing the volumes. Uh, And so that's the exact opposite of what they did, right, for the HSCA. They kept them all the... Well, well, it's funny, they did do 12 volumes to the HSCA as well, but I think you're right. I think they regretted releasing those volumes at the end of the day. They were in between a rock and a hard place. They had to do something to keep people quiet. Alan Dulles' thinking was, you know, let's give them written documents nobody in this country reads anyway. And, you know, tell you, Alan Dulles wasn't far from wrong. You know, I mean, I I am somebody who does love to read. And uh, most people don't consider this kind of reading a priority. Right. Um... Is there anything else that you wanna that you wanna add on to uh onto what we talked about about the Tippett case? Is there anything we didn't No, uh, I think we did a, I think we did a pretty good job covering it. I you know, there's no reason to go into minutiae. I think we hit the broad strokes. Uh I don't think that people wanna be dragged into the weeds. Uh I wanna keep the broad uh highlights in everybody's mind. You know, two wallets of Oswald were found at the scene. One, uh, you know, supposedly at the murder scene of Tippett and the other uh, at the theater. That doesn't make a lick of sense. And why in the world would he carry Oswald and Hidel cards if he was uh, going to deny killing the president? And, of course, the Hidel card was absolutely essential because the rifle that killed the president was ordered under the name of Hidel. Uh, why would you create a paper trail that connected you to the assassination of the president and then deny it instead of taking credit in front of the whole world? It doesn't make a lick of sense unless you're being set up. And the same is true with the, uh, with the death of Tippett. You know, he denied having anything to do with the death of Tippett, just like he denied having to do with the death of Kennedy, and I think he told the truth. Right. I mean, there seems to be no obvious escape plan for him, right? There was no, not much money in the wallet. No, no. no. And he didn't have a bus ticket. Uh, now, the question, the $94 question was, why did he go to the theater? And uh, I, I don't think he went to the theater to hide, uh, although that's a possibility. I think he went to the theater because he was supposed to meet somebody. And in fact, you know, he had the, he had a half of a card of the place where his mother worked at Cox's in Fort Worth. He had uh, half of the card in his possession, and I think he was supposed to meet somebody who had the other half. That's an old tradecraft thing. Oswald wa- always wanted to be a spy, whether he was or not. It was another thing, but he wanted to be a spy. And I think he thought of himself as a spy. And who was he spying for is you know, one of the great questions, but I think he thought that he was working with, you know, the U.S. government, whether it was FBI or, you know, ONI or CIA. It doesn't really much matter. That's what he thought he was doing. He thought, I think he thought he was helping. Hmm. And I think when he ran to the theater, he was trying to find his contact, who he was supposed to meet in terms of any emergency, and, and try to get some guidance. And so your, I mean, your best sense of his role is basically just the absolute patsy. He was, he he was. Yeah, I I think he was an absolute patsy. I think he got completely set up. You know, why in the world would he be 
sticking around at lunchtime. You know, and why in the world would he run home to get his revolver? You know, I mean, what kind of operation is that? Uh-huh. After you've killed the president, run home and get your gun? That's a little late, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and, leave, and, and, and leave the rifle that ties you and, and not even throw away the ID that ties you? I mean, it, none of it makes any sense. I think he, uh, when you read the descriptions of his reaction, as the evidence started dropping in on him throughout the day. He gets more and more and more ashen and less and less and less cocky. Right. Yeah, I know some of those photos of him are pretty heartbreaking after you kind of see yeah, at the beginning. Feel, he's very. Feel like he's very, you know, you know he's, uh, I stand on my rights. I stand on my rights. And he realizes the ground's been cut out from under. Right. Well, it was, uh, there is in one of those speeches by Fidel Castro where he he talks about Oswald, you know, he makes a point that if you do something like this, you either have a plan to escape and you're not if you're not going to admit it, you have a plan to escape or if you do it because you're a fanatic, you're going to say, "Yes, of course I did it." So Oswald is definitely a, a He did neither. That's right. right. He did neither. And that's the tip off. It doesn't make a lick of sense unless you can set up. Um, cool. Well, I think that's uh, that's a good place, good place to end. Um, yeah. No. I. Uh, you know, we're all looking forward. I know uh, there's a lot of people talking about the mock trial. So uh, good luck with that. Uh, and and thank, thank you for you. talking. My pleasure. It's really great to uh, you know share one's thinking on a, a case this important and how it affects. American history and how I think in you know the decades uh, to come we're going to put a resolution on this case in a good way. Well, I hope so. It's definitely definitely about time for that. Oh, uh, great! Well, thanks a lot, Bill. I, I hope that uh, I hope that we can we can talk again. Look forward. Take care, Dave. Bye bye.